On another note, with the for Jeff, yeah, I think he's back there now praying. And this, we put out a prayer request after our meeting last Sunday about the the building next door. We put out a prayer request that the Lord's will be done, and it seems to be opening doors. So we haven't like signed anything yet, but they they accepted our bid or they accepted our offer, um, and it's looks to be uh, like it's in the works. I'm going to put this down just a little bit. I'm going to get some feedback. I think that might be a little bit better, maybe. Yeah. Okay, so I think, it, yeah, I see uh, answer prayers happening there, too. So we keep praying. It hasn't been finalized yet. We'll see what happens with that. Today's sermon, we're talking about Jonathan. Um, and we... Jonathan was the son of Saul. And you, first, you find this in 1 Samuel chapter 12. We kind of see how Saul was put into, into his kingship. Um, and if you remember the story, I'll just go over that story very quickly. With, um, with Saul, he was a young man, right? Tall and ruddy. No, David's the ruddy one. He was just tall and, and uh, stocky and big man. And Samuel was called by God to go appoint him as king and anoint him. And did, did, did the whole country just say, hey, yeah, let's, we'll accept him. He'll be our king. Does anyone know? Actually, it didn't happen that way. They're like, well, I don't know. Who's, he's from Benjamin, this tribe of Benjamin. Who, you know, we got other bigger tribes. Why are we picking this guy? So there was a bit of an issue. But then there was one town... I think it was uh, Gilead, was, came under threat of a big army. And Saul steps up as the king. He says, let's go help these guys. And he rallied the people, and he helped the city of Gilead. And then after that, then all the people said, okay, yeah, he can be our king now. So they appointed him king. In chapter 13, we see where he then has he's been reigning for one year. And in verse 1, he says it's, it rained for one year, and, uh, or two years, actually. And then he sets up 3,000 soldiers. He takes 3,000 soldiers and says, you guys are going to be full-time soldiers. Everyone else can go off home. When we need you, we'll call you. He takes 2,000 for himself, and he leaves 1,000 for his son, Jonathan. So he's, obviously, Jonathan is kind of like the general, one of the generals in the in his army there. So Jonathan has control of 1,000 troops and Saul has control of 2,000. Now, if you're, not, if you're not sure about this or if you're not, if you don't remember, let's put it that way, the Philistines were pretty much a, a pain in the side of Israel at that time. They had the control over Israel. They had troops all over Israel. They would tax them. They would tell them what they could do. And later on in the chapter, we'd actually find out that they couldn't even take, uh, they couldn't even have a blacksmith in their community because the, the uh, Philistines didn't want them making their own weapons. So they had to take their, their plowshares, their pick, pick forks, uh, pitchforks, their, their axes down to the Philistines to get them sharpened and the work done. This is a control issue that the, well, I mean, it kept them from building an army, I suppose. So that's the situation they're in. They're under control of these Philistines. Their army is pretty small and doesn't have big weapons. Now, Jonathan, though, Jonathan comes along with his his people, I don't know how many he took, but he comes along, and I think in verse 3, we see him just out of the blue. He goes and attacks the Philistines. And so then Jonathan attacked the Phil garrison of the Philistine that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Then Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. If you go on and read, though, it didn't work out quite as well as it did the first time. Because the Philistines, they weren't just a little country now. They, were, they had lots of resources. So what we see the Philistines doing, in verse 5, the Philistines gathered together to fight the Israelites. In some translations, they said 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen. So other translations might say 3,000 chariots. Either way, it's a lot of chariots. 
6,000 horsemen and as many troops as you, you can't number. It's like the sands of the seas are gathering up to go fight Israel because Israel seems to be rebellion. The Israelites were scared to death. They went to the hills. They went to the caves and they hid. It didn't work so well this time. So Saul yells out, come on, muster the troops, guys. Let's go. And they say, not this time, Saul. Not this time. We're going to run for the mountains. We're going to save our necks here. But he was able to get 600 folks that was come. And we, we see that, um, I think that's in chapter 14. We see that there's 600 folks come. If we jump over to chapter 14, we'll pick it up there. Now it happened one day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, that the, the young man, to the young man, he said, he said to the young man who bore his armor, come let us go over to the Philistine garrison that is on the other side. But he did not tell his father. In verse 2, and Saul was sitting in the, the outskirts of Gibeah under a pomegranate tree, which is in Migron. The people who were with him were about 600 men. So that's the whole army he had, with 600 men. And uh, yeah, if you're not sure about this, this old weapons thing, is verse 23 and 22 and 23 of, of chapter 13, it says that no one had any weapons at all. All they had was their pitchforks and their axes and their, their, their stuff like that. So you have a picture here then, except for Saul and Jonathan had actual weapons and armor. That's the only two of all of them. So you see the 600 people here with two proper weapons. All the rest of it is just kind of farm material, farm implements. And they're standing up against thousands and thousands of very well armed and very well trained soldiers with lots of resources, horses and, and chariots. Now, it said there in verse 1 that Jonathan, just one day, he decided, he stood up and he said, hey, armor bearer, let's go. Let's go see these guys. And he didn't tell anyone. He didn't tell his father what he was doing. He said, let's go. And let's go see these guys. Let's go, uh, uh, um, go see this, these Philist Philistines. In verse 7, uh, verse 6 actually, as he's, as he's coming to the, uh, to the Philistines, the garrisons there, he says, And Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of this uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing retrains or restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. Let me repeat that again because I was stumbling a little bit. Nothing restrains the Lord from saving by few, by many or by few. And so he says that just the two of us, one sword, a little bit of armor, and the, the armor bearer might have had some kind of axe or something with him, but let's go over here and see what the Lord will do. See what the Lord can do with the situation here. So they're walking over there. And, and a good point, though, is he didn't have a plan B in this, did he? He didn't tell his dad, you know, hey, if, if you don't see me coming soon, send to Calvary, right? Because I might be in trouble. He said, no, I have a feeling in the Lord. The Lord put it on my heart that we're to do this. And so he says, come on, let's go. And without telling anyone else, they went to see this garrison, to go this this troop of, uh, of Philistines. And in verse 7, and as we, as we take this up, he asks for a sign. He says, so, so his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Go there, go then. Here I am with the according to you here. Then Jonathan said, very well, let us cross over to these men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our plain place and not go up to them. But if they say to us, come up to us, then we will go up. For the Lord has delivered them into our hands, and this will be a sign to us. Now, I like the faith of Jonathan. 
So we see the picture a little bit more. This is obviously there's some big mountain, you know, the, I don't know if it's a big mountain, a good sized hill, anyways, that the, that the garrison, the Philistine garrison, has decided to take the high road or the high, uh, the high area, and they have a little garrison up there. And Jonathan says, he asked for a sign. Kind of like Gideon asked for a sign, didn't he? Gideon asked for a sign too. Jonathan's sign was about similar to Gideon's or a little bit different. I remember Gideon's sign. Gideon's sign was, was he put a, a fleece out, a, a fleece of a, a sheep, some sheep fur, and you put it on the ground, and he says in the morning, if the, if the ground is uh, dry and the, sh the fleece is wet, I believe that God has said it. And then he went there. Sure enough, the fleece is wet. The ground is dry. Wow. Oh, but you know what? I still don't want to go, so let's do it again. How about tomorrow morning? Let's see if the fleece will be dry, because the fleece could have soaked up all the dew around it, you know, who knows? Let's see if the fleece will be dry, and now the ground will be wet. Now I'll really know. Sure enough, that's what happened. The next day, the fleece was soaking, or it was very dry, and the ground was all wet. So he had no excuses then. But Jonathan's was different, though. Jonathan's, I see a different sign that Jonathan was asking. I see this is a sign of, of a, um, what's the word I'm trying to think of here? He was, he was believing. He trusted God. It was confidence. That's the word. I'm he had confidence in God. He had confidence that God that was going to be able to deliver him, but he had also confidence that God, you know, he would, he would give me what I need and uh, he would speak to me. He didn't ask, if they come down to me, if they come down to me, then I'll know God has given them in their hands. He asked, if they say to me, come up to us, then I know God's given them in their hands. Now, just think about this for a moment, you know? If you as a company of, if you, you had the high ground in a war, what's the advantage of a high ground, by the way? You can see everything. Is there another advantage? Hard to tack up. You got gravity on your side. It's people coming up get tired. You can throw things down. You can roll boulders down. You can throw swords or spears down at them. Big advantage to having the high ground. So if you see an enemy coming, what's the natural thing you're going to say? You're going to say, well, we're going to come down to you. A bit lazy, probably, too. They said, no, if you come on up here, we're going to show you a thing or two, is what they said. This is a sign that Jonathan is asking for. If they say a perfectly natural thing, then I'm going to believe it's from God. <laughs> you know, it was, it was a sign, it was a asking with confidence, right? He knew God would put it on his heart. He knew God was going to deliver it. He just wanted a little extra sign. A little extra sign. And also, at that sign, he said, you know, if they come down to us, we're going to stand fast anyways. We're not running if they come down to us. So either way, the sign really was going to be taken care of. But he, he, he did ask so the Lord would kind of show him for sure. And he did. And as soon as they said that, they said, come on up to us. And we will show you a thing or two. And he says, come, let's go then. Verse 12, he says, Then the men of the garrisons called to Jonathan and to his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you something. Jonathan said to the armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. If you continue reading down there, I think it tells us, in the next, yeah, the next verse 14, that there's 20 men up there. 20 men. So picture this. Can you imagine climbing up a, a hill so steep that you got to do it on your hands and knees? I love climbing mountains. I love climbing hills. The steeper it is, the harder it is to get up there, right? <laughs> the more huffing and puffing you got to do to get up there. So he gets up there with his one sword, one man, facing these 20 folks. I also look at that and I say, what about these, 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 uh, 
these Philistines on the top, they had the advantage of the high ground. But they didn't use it. You're not reading anywhere where they had to dodge the boulders, they had to dodge spears or arrows coming down at them. They stood up there, you know, thinking, okay, there's 20 of us, two of them. When they get up here, we'll just overwhelm them, right? We'll just jump on them and overwhelm them. Can that be that way, too, as we are facing challenges in our lives? We know there's something big in front of us, bigger than we can handle. But God has put something on our hearts to do it. It might go smooth for a little while. We have to put our work into it. It might go smooth for a little while. I think the enemy, enemy does that sometimes. Sometimes he'll make it hard right from the get-go, but sometimes he'll just kind of back off and say, yeah, let you get up and have a little confidence and we're just going to overwhelm him with all our, all our difficulties, all our power, and all our strength. That's what the enemy's idea was to do. If they figured they had it locked up. 20 against 1. We're on the high ground. They'll be puffing and panting when they get to the top. That wasn't the result, was it? No, because Jonathan knew that, the, that he had, the God had given it to him. He went up there with the great confidence. He put his effort into it. He put his effort into it. And I, also going back to that, that uh, asking for the sign, I mean, he could have said, if they come down to us, that's a sign from God. It makes it easier, right? I don't have to climb up to them. He says, no, I'm willing to put my effort into this. I'm willing to put my, my strength, all my energy into this to make it happen. But then I trust that he will do the, he'll make it, he will overcome all the odds that he will actually make it happen. But I can do my part. And so that's what happens. So they climb up there and the first, let's see, uh, verse 14, the first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was 20. No, 13, but you need to read this. So. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and knees with his armor bearer after him, and, and they fell before Jonathan, and he came, and as he came after him, the armor bearer killed them. So. Probably didn't need to read that, but <laughs> there was a it showed you a little bit of teamwork anyways because Jonathan just knocks him down and the armor bearer comes down behind him and puts an end to it. So you do see a bit of a teamwork in there. And so unfortunately in the, in the Old Testament we see a bit of uh, uh, warfare and, and that kind of stuff going on also. This isn't a, this isn't a sermon on that, but I don't know, I'm just feeling impressed to go that route. What's the New Testament? How, how do we fight battles in the New Testament? With the Word of God. That's the sword now he shows us. Huh? How do we fight our enemies? By prayer, by love, by doing good deeds, by offering them water when they're thirsty, when they're hungry, When we fight our enemies, that's the way we fight in the New Testament. Some in the Old Testament did that too. Elisha did that. Elisha just let go of whole great armies with goodness and fed them <laughs> the enemies. But God is asking us to fight the battles. Yes, He's asking us to fight the battles of faith, with His faith. To fight the battles is uh, in, a, in a way that would full of confidence and put away from all fears. Now at the end of the story is, all these folks came from the caves. All the Israelites, they came running out of the caves um, because Jonathan had started something um, that wouldn't stop, that would not stop. The earth started shaking. The earth started shaking. The, the Philistines started getting all confused and they started fighting against each other. Sword against their own sword. The Israelites came out of the caves and started chasing after them. And one man, one man's faith, routed the whole army. The whole army. Because he was willing to follow God. He was being, 
He was being called by God to do something. It was bigger than him, but he was willing to do it. He was willing to put his energy into it. He was willing to go out in faith and trust and actually make it happen. So one man, one man's faith can overcome all things. And we have that same faith. We have the same ability to follow God if he puts something on our hearts. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter how big it is, what, what there has to be overcome. Sometimes we have family relationships that are so bad, that have been so toxic for so many years, could that be overcome by one person's faith? Could it? I think it could. Sometimes we've been hurt so bad that we have unforgiveness in our hearts that is so hard to get through, so hard to find a forgiveness for somebody that's hurt us so badly. That could be overcome by faith, by faith also. Maybe God is asking us to do a ministry that we just don't have the time, the finances, or the ability to do that we think, but we know God has asked us to do it. 3ABN is a good example of that. The ministry in the United States for worldwide TV ministry. The thing is, if God is asking us to do something, whether it's just to surrender our hearts a little bit more in one area, maybe a sin that we're struggling with, maybe a family relationship to make it right, do, to do our part to make it right. We can't do the other person's part, but we can do our part and pray. Or if he's asking us to do something big for him in ministry. The point is it can be done. And this is not the only story. Gideon, you have David, you have on and on and on. God is just continually always showing us it can be done if we trust him and if we listen to the calling in our heart. And go out in faith and put our labors into it. Put our work at it. We know at the end, Jonathan, who did he give credit to? Did he say it was me? Yeah, strong, aren't I? No. He knew who the credit gave, who, who the credit was deserved to, but he put the effort in. He put all of his effort in. And God answered and did some great things. So I praise God for these little, little uh, examples of faith, and I encourage you. I encourage you, when God speaks to your heart, step out in faith and make it happen. He's got great things happening. Great, great ideas for you. Life-changing ideas. It changed the, the landscape of that world, that, that country. And he can do great things with you, too. Uh, we're going to have our last hymn now.